We'll begin with the data requirements for building a process analysis within Timeline. So what you have on screen is the manual data upload and mapping page where a user can point to a file with some events related to the process they're looking to analyze and begin to map fields. Now the three fields to the left are our three required data fields. We need to make sure we have a timestamp that denotes when any given step in the process occurred. A timeline or case ID. In this scenario, we're tracking insurance claims through an insurance provi provider's workflow. So this data point would be a claim number or a claim ID in this case. And then lastly, we need an event name, some description for what happened to the claim at that given point in time. To the right, you can see we've got our attributes or dimensional fields, ways that we're going to filter, slice and dice, drive root cause correlation to look at trends. So you can bring as many or as few of these extra attribute fields as makes sense. Typically you'll see things like the people associated, the type of case it was, the amount, and so on. Now this manual mapping exercise is typically done in the beginning stages of a project. As clients move towards a production phase, they're setting this data flow to occur based on whatever kind of a time schedule makes sense for them and their specific use case. And that's done um, based on whatever kind of an interval they'd like to set. Now, in, in loading data across different systems of record, the only requirement there is that we can map to some common case ID across those data inputs. All the other fields can be totally different, provided we can get that match case ID. The tool will automatically insert events across all those disparate inputs into the correct timelines automatically for you. Provided we don't have a file that's as well formed and prepared as the one you see on screen, we also give users the ability to, to transform data using our ETL in the cloud capability. So this is kind of an intermediary step where we can load a data file that we'd like to clean up or get ready for analysis and all of our transformation operations, which a few of those you can see along the top here, are done directly within the UI. There's no scripting or coding anywhere, as you'll see, as we go through timeline. So what I can do is I, I have an operation I want to add to clean up this data file. And here's a list of operations available to me. Timestamp, string operations, date transformations, data cleanup via deletions, creating new fields, cross table joins. It's a pretty exhaustive list. And as you can see, I simply select the function I'd like to add to my list and then build it out here in the graphical user interface. So we're allowing for a maybe less technical type of a user to use this tool and not have to go back to IT or the DBAs to make to request to make those changes to the data files. Now we string together our series of operations. Eventually, we would be then ready to load that data into a project. And once our file was prepared and we we're happy with it, we would load that into a project for analysis. So let's jump back into the analytical side of things, back into our insurance claims project. Now the first page that users typically get started with here is our process view page. And within that you can see we've got our primary path view. This allows us to iterate through the different possible process variants or behaviors. And you can see I'm adding more complexity to my schema here as we go, adding more different uh, interesting and obscure pathways that might occur, the top 11 or so pathways. And to the right, you can see as I change this, uh, the variance count on the left, the metrics and the charts on the right are going to scope to show me more data that's now in scope based on allowing for more different possible variation. So I can trend metrics over time or over the different possible process behaviors. Now within this primary path view, I've also got the milestone view, which allows a user to build any custom schema that they're interested in analyzing. So I can pick from any different event and build as high level schema as the full end to end perspective of my process. If I want to hone in on a specific system or line of business, I can build a schema simply based around those data touch points. And I can learn a few different things from this, including metrics like volume, like where time is elapsing 
in between any given step. You see as I mouse over each transition, it shows you the average duration. I can also animate this and get a look as to what throughput is visualized as as a part of this model. And you see each of the circles represents a claim or a group of claims as they speed up, slow down, bunch up and back up in certain cases, denoting a visual bottleneck. That's going to negatively affect your throughput efficiency. Changing of colors represents aging. So there's some other kind of interesting statistics and insights I can glean from building out these schemas and taking a look at what my throughput and where things are slowing down. Maybe I want to further analyze specific segments that I've uncovered here using some of the 25 plus analytical tools that are available to me. And now this is my navigation pane. So I've got all of my different tools here with a few all over, over here grouped to the side as well, which we'll talk about. Each analytical tool or module has been purpose built to answer a specific type of process related question. So you'll see that as we go. So we'll move now in, from this high level schema where we get kind of a 30,000 foot view of the process to our path analysis. Now what this is showing you is a frequency distribution of all of the different process execution patterns or behaviors right now grouped to show me the most commonly executed series of steps here to the left. All right, so 1704 claims have taken this series uh, this pattern of, of, of steps relative to the events listed here and as I scroll to the right you see more and more interesting and obscure behaviors somewhere we're skipping steps going backward to repeat steps pinballing back and forth at certain stages and I can scroll this all the way over so now I'm not uh, beholden to that single high-level process schema I can see all of my different variants and I can compare them by the metrics that I care about one being of course risk how and why would you skip certain steps or do things out of order? Right? I could pick that out here visually. I can compare each pattern and behavior relative to how long it's taken on average to complete. So when we send a claim this series, it's 17 days versus just two to the right, it's two weeks on average longer to execute a claim. We, we also, just for reference, we have this linear perspective on the process. If I change this over, we can get that schema representation. If I'm more interested in viewing it this way, I can see branching and loopbacks. And lastly, we also have the ability to look at the bottom line and how that's affected. What is the actual cost to me as the insurance provider when we execute one series of steps versus another? Now another key concept here, once I find something of interest, and this really goes for any analytical tool that you'll see today, is I can select that, one or more of these pathways, in this case I'm taking a high cost variant, and I apply a filter, and now all of the metrics that I look at and within the analytical tools are going to be scoped around this 1,196 claims that I've deemed to be too high cost for my liking. Okay. So let's go forward with this and I want to show you the lowest level of detail or granularity we have with which to look at our process. That's the timelines view. So every claim gets its own unique horizontal line here which is a timeline. The icons represent the stages that have occurred along the way. And if I'd like to I can go down to this level to do my analysis. I can see here is all of the interrelated steps for claim number X when we received it, went on to process it, assigned people, where we incurred cost. Right? And again, this is across all different systems of record we would have loaded data for. So this is that full end-to-end -end perspective of any given claim, where the costs were incurred, where those attributes come to play. Right? And so you've seen the three levels of perspective, that high-level schema, the path with all the different variations, as well as the timeline to go down to the single case view. Now, I want to go back to that thread where I set that filter. Right? I set that filter on the path analysis to denote the high cost claims and pretty high volume from what we saw. Next, I want to move into our breakdown view. Let's look for some root cause correlation if we can. If I was going to try to change or improve my process, right, or try to move away from doing these high cost patterns, where should I focus? Right? And so this is where we use those attributes. Right now, I've got these high cost claims broken by state. It's a pretty even distribution here. There's nothing that really stands out or is interesting to me. Maybe let's change that and let's say, let's look at it by the agent responsible for processing the claims. More compelling in this scenario, right? Now I've got 
a, a single agent responsible for roughly 41 percent of these high cost claims. So you can imagine, I use these extra data points to point me in the direction, whether it's a conversation with Carrie Ann about what she's been working on and how we can help, or it's a type of claim that's giving us an issue that we need to understand what, how technology is interfacing with those types, right? This is pointing us to, so that it's no longer a needle in a haystack. We can focus our remediation efforts. And I can even focus in on Carrie Ann, choose to set her as a filter, and maybe go back to my timelines and take a look at exactly what Carrie Ann has been working working on and responsible for. Okay, let's go back. We'll clear out all the filters that have been set. I want to introduce two more concepts here quickly before we get to some other uh, more in-depth types of analysis. That one being our metric panel. So this is something we can expand out here to the right. And again, all of this is built by default. I didn't need to configure any of these things. Uh, but I have the ability to look at my duration, my, my event list that shows me the different event types that are occurring within my workflow. And within any of these um, metric or histogram views, I can actually pop this up to get more detail. So in clicking on my duration, now I see a histogram with all of my claims by how long they've taken to execute. You can see my minimum turnaround time, my average, as well as my maximum. And I can adjust these sliders to start to see how many claims took us above or below any given time threshold. So right now I can see 35, uh, over 35 days, we've got 10% of my population. And I might want to hone in on just those that took longer than 35 days and start to investigate uh, more in, and gain more insights specifically on those. Just to show you how we can go even a level deeper within this histogram, I can say I'd like to break this down by let's just say my adjusters and see how they fare based on how long it's taken them to execute claims. And now I have all of my different histograms broken by the different adjusters. And now it's just a visual exercise. Uh, these all look relatively consistent, but I've got Jim Ricks, who obviously stands out here, quite a bit skewed to the right is his histogram. Well, I saw my general average is 23 days. Let's let me sub in Jim Ricks and I see that Jim Ricks on average has taken three and a half months. Just another idea here. Maybe it's, maybe it's time to have a conversation with Jim or understand a bit more about what he's been working on. So that's a way to use these metrics. Now I'm going back to my analytical modules. I want to focus now on bottleneck analysis because what was nice is that duration is an interesting metric surely and you can trend it over time to see how your throughput chimes are changing. But what bottleneck does is break where time is spent down to a much smaller, more granular level, almost a task or process segment level. Okay, and so we'd be interested when we're improving our process in really understanding where time is spent at that type of detail, right? Where are we spending the most amount of time on a step-to-step uh, -step basis? And so what that does is, ex what this view does is exactly that. How often and how long does it take for us to go from first notice of loss to coverage confirmed? From this event to this event, okay? And you can see I've got metrics. How often does that transition occur? How often per timeline? How, what's the average amount of time it takes us to execute that step or segment? How does that roll up to the total amount of hours we've spent in this specific stage? And then as a percentage of all time spent processing these claims, where has the bulk of it occur, been spent? And again, no configuration necessary. I can simply come into this bottleneck view, sort on this total time percentage metric, and now what you've got is a stack ranking of your most costly process stages from a time standpoint. Okay, and now I can go a step further in the understanding this. I say, all right, well, this ready for final review to claim filed, maybe it shouldn't be taking us 43 hours on average. There's some way I can speed this up, automate claims of a, of a low cost threshold, etc. Let's take a, a goal of changing this from 43 hours to 34 hours on average. And I put that in here in my new time. This would be an effort we would put into improving our process. And we could do a bit of what if analysis. Now this tells us, hey, you would stand to gain 173,000 plus hours by making that improvement to that specific part of the process. Now we can do this with a time metric, but also as well as cost and driving cost out of our process. Now I want to show you a typical question is, well, how do you get these cost information? We looked at it in path. We're now looking at it in bottleneck. We've got it in our different uh, histograms. 
cost is there's no assumption that you have cost data simply ready to input into the system via your source file. So we give you a, an inline cost calculator or a cost configuration capability that allows you to get as detailed or as high level as makes sense for your cost calculations. So whether it be a fixed cost every time we do a step, so this is all step based. So when an event occurs, it costs us X and we can estimate that at first and maybe over time refine it and get more specific. Do I have that as a data point in my input table? Do I have relational costing where if I do it with one role it costs X, with another role it costs Y? And then similarly we can do it from a time basis. How long does it take us to complete a certain task? Right. So we calculate the time and then put in the costing value there accordingly. So that, that's how cost is calculated. And what I see people typically doing is start high level and, as I said, iterate over time and add more depth and detail. Now, I want to jump ahead a little bit. What you've seen thus far are really the discovery building blocks. When I first upload my data, all this information is just readily available for me and I want to interrogate it, gain some insights, and maybe try to make some changes. Now, as we push ahead in our implementation lifecycle, we might want to do a bit of comparing. And in this scenario, maybe we want to compare a pre-process modification or pre-automation set of data and then a post so we can track and trend how has our improvement effort really fared? Are we hitting the mark? Right? Are we getting the results that we expected to see? So on the left side, we have a series of metrics that are relative to pre-implementation. Okay, before making any change, here were our basis lines. Since we made that change and went into production, here's how we fared. Let's just track and trend. Our duration dropped considerably. We're doing more less steps. Our claim cost has gone down. This would be a rousing success, right? Now, that's great, and maybe you would take this to management. They could easily understand this and say, hey, we need to adopt more of what we've just done, be it automation or otherwise, and uh, you know, scale this across the organization. These are these results don't lie. On the flip side, you want to know just as badly if you haven't hit the mark so that you can go back, tweak your efforts, simply walk away from the project altogether and move on to another opportunity. Either way, this level of transparency is extremely, extremely valuable. All right, I'm going to go back to my all timelines view and I want to show you some of the more in-depth type of analytical tools that we have available. One of those being over here to the right in our filtering tools in our query module. This allows us to build specific, very uh, kind of complex process scenario based questions, all done within the graphical user interface. As I said, no code whatsoever needing to be written here. But again, we're able to answer very complex type of questions that we can't answer in any other tool that's out there. So what I've built here is a query that asks this. It says how often do we, what we would assume is we confirm coverage, but what we're saying here, we actually never confirm coverage. So this step never happened. Yet we went on to issue a rental car to a claimant. That claim then comes back as denied because ostensibly we never confirmed that they were covered to begin with. Thankfully, that claimant then decided to return the rental car back to us, but they took four days since sending that denial notice, driving up the cost of the claim to us as a business, of course. So you can see we're asking scenario, sequence-based, are things happening or not happening in a given order? We can ask about time gaps in between stages, okay, less, more or less than a specific amount of time. We can include uh, iterations. So did this, ha we issue three or more rental cars to get even more specific or and or we can add uh, values around our dimensions or attributes. So you can imagine I can get very very particular and specific about the question. It's kind of like a hypothesis test. I wonder if this scenario might be occurring within my process. I can just graphically build it out just as you would say it out loud essentially and then very quickly get a response that says yes or no. So I click search, you get a very sub-second response time, right? And it tells you, yeah, you've got that sequence occurring actually. Here are the 44 cases where that scenario has occurred. Now I'm off and running figuring out who, what, when, where, why. We need to ensure that this doesn't happen on a go forward basis. And how do we do that? Right? That's by being more proactive. So query is kind of a search mechanism. We've also got the concept of protocols. 
that allows us to do something similar but a little different from a logic perspective. Here we can build in our rules, our expectations, our SLAs. So this, for example, is a salvage protocol. And we can have a whole library of these protocols around just certain segments of our process where when we hit this stage, we must do the next two or three steps within order in a given time frame else it's going to be a compliance issue or our customer satisfaction drops considerably, right? whatever the outcome might be. So here's a salvage protocol. We're not going to salvage all, ca all cars, but when we do, we get an estimate prepared, it gets approved, and then we want within that total loss confirmed and the salvage complete to happen in under 10 days. Otherwise, that vehicle is just a, a depreciating asset rusting away on a lot somewhere, essentially. Okay, So now, we, we build this, and like I said with our query, it's going to show us where we match where all the cases that followed that condition we created, whereas protocols, we want the inverse. Where have we violated? I don't care if we match. That's what I expect. I want to see here where we haven't hit the time frame or followed the pattern that I've put forward. So if I click show violations, here are all the ways that this protocol was not followed, was violated, along with very specific feedback as to what went wrong, whether something was missed, a time violation, happened out of order, maybe it happened too many times. Right? And I can hone in on any of these violations very specifically by using that filter mechanism that we saw earlier. Now, the idea of being more preemptive and proactive, I can now tie my protocols, these process expectations, to my alerting mechanism. Okay, so as we're continuously loading data, we're checking against those rules we've already created. And we allow the user to define specific alerts that can either notify a human via text message, via email. Hey, step in, we're about to miss SLA. Or hey, this step, this coverage confirmation was skipped. We're not allowed to go any further downstream until that is checked off, right? To avoid any of those negative results. We can also trigger third-party software via web, via web hooks. So we can send a web service call to an RPA, uh, an automation platform, for example, spawn a BPM process, open a service ticket, right? Whatever is, is best suited to push forward that issue remediation that we've just uncovered within Timeline before a person even has to become involved. And so this is really powerful and can get as close to closed loop remediation as is possible, the ability to trigger those downstream workflows. Okay, the last uh, piece I want to talk about here is going to be the brand new simulation capability. Now, what this allows us to do are build in some future state variables or uh, scenarios and understand exactly how our process would look should we make those types of changes? So again, trying to future-proof the efforts that we put in, whether it be in te in injecting technology or retraining our folks or injecting some uh, you know, automation, let's ensure that we have the best chance of success in getting the results that we set out for. So there's a number of different uh, uh, variables that we can adjust here. We can look at any given step and say, and reorder exactly how the process is executed. So how often do we come in to this process or assign step and actually execute that event? And how often do we go out to the downstream stages? So this would be changing the sequencing or the pattern of how the process is executed. We can also modify the amount of time that it takes to go from one stage to another. And we can do that using our histograms as we saw earlier, or simply just saying, hey, if I automate this, it's gonna make it 50% faster. So show me what it would look like if this step was done 50% more quickly. And you know how does that look at from a full end-to-end -end process perspective? Maybe this processor assigned step sp sped up, but we just kind of kick a bottleneck down the, down the flow a bit, and we really don't save overall time in the overall processing and throughput. right? So we want to understand that. We can also assign resources to understand, hey, if I increase or decrease the amount of resources available at any step, how is that going to affect my wait time and my throughput time? Then we can start to look at the results and do comparisons, right? And start to understand um, how our different scenarios compare against one another. 
and what the results are, how, how, what is the average duration, the min, max, all the kind of statistics that you'd be interested in. What is the cost when you have certain resources and certain throughput criteria, right? When, and when I have two adjusters versus 10 adjusters versus 15 adjusters, right? What is my different waiting time? look like and visualize that. It's trying to get, hey, the right level of automation as well as the right level of resource allocation at any given stage. Okay, so we'll finish there. I just want to underscore here all the different tools that are available. You've gotten to see maybe 50 to 60 percent of the different available tools. There's tons more here if you're interested in learning more. Certainly reach out um, and thank you for standing by.